traditional super fun and all about artisan cheese and more to melt your peaceful heart and toast your peaceful life. Coming to you from the Appalachian Mountains of southwestern Virginia, this is the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hey, this is Scott Hall from Peaceful Heart Farm, and you are listening to the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hello, everybody. Melanie Hall here. I hope you are doing well. The conversation today and every day revolves around the value of tradition, traditional living, traditional food prep and storage, traditional cooking, and, of course, traditional artisan cheese. Topics discussed here are designed to create new perspectives and possibilities for how you might add the taste of tradition to your life. Now, have you asked yourself the question, how long should raw milk last? Probably only if you drink raw milk. (laughs) Anyway, it's a good question, and I'll address it today. And I'm going to provide a great ice cream base recipe. You won't have to worry about the cream lasting a long time. Your cream won't last long because ice cream recipe uses it up. And homemade ice cream is the perfect complement to an early autumn day that feels like summer is still hanging on. Welcome new listeners and welcome back veteran homestead loving regulars. I appreciate you stopping by the Farmcast every week. There absolutely wouldn't be a show without you. All right. Are you ready to get to it? Let's go. We're going to do some, of course, some homestead life updates and then the topic, how long should raw milk last? And then finally, the ice cream base recipe complete with downloads for flavoring recipes as well. So you can use the plain ice cream and then there's the amount of flavorings that you would add to make different kinds of ice cream. All right. Well, as far as the homestead goes, the garden is done. Um, well, there are a few sweet potatoes to be dug up, but other than that, it's all gone. Whew. Now we can take a rest until spring. Just kidding. <laughs> there are cleanup tasks and winter preparation of the beds, adding compost to improve the soil over the winter, covering the beds to keep the moisture in and the weeds out. Um, but those are actually pretty small compared to what happens during the heat of the season. The quail. We are uh, ready for another batch of quail eggs in the incubator. And there there won't be so many this time. Uh, And it's due to the reduction of daylight. Uh, They don't lay as many eggs. So last time it was 47. This time it'll be less than 30. Whatever comes in today will be the last of this period of collection. Um, Eggs can be collected for 7 to 10 days and kept in a cool environment, but not in the refrigerator. And then however many you collect over that time, we collect over that time, that would be how many we would incubate. Then we go back to collecting them, and and, uh, Scott will be eating them. Now, most of our quail are brown coternics. Um, It's a Japanese breed. They're tan and brown with spotted plumage. And we have one white one from the original batch of eggs that we purchased, and one white one from that first batch that we hatched out a couple of months ago. Those guys are already mature. <clears throat> the males are fertile. The females are old enough to begin laying eggs if they get enough light. And uh, so we'll take out, from that group, we'll take out enough females to fill out our breeding stock. So we have three cages of breeding stock, one rooster and I think five hens, one rooster, and five hens will be in each one of those. And right now it's like one and three and one and two. <clears throat> so there will be a few that will go in there. And then the rest of them will go to freezer camp. And I'll make that uh, instant pot quail recipe that I posted uh, a few weeks ago. Now the cows, we are down to one bull from this year's cows. We've sold all the others. And we have just offered up a Gwaine for sale as well. She is our purebred Jersey heifer calf. Um, her mother is certified A2A2, and her sire is also certified A2. So she's going to be an A2A2 genetic uh, cow when she starts producing milk. And if you're interested, please let us know. She's a lovely calf and quite affectionate if she thinks you have a bottle. <laughs> We're weaning her, and she has only a day or so left. Uh, where she'll get milk and at five and a half months old she's developed enough to live on grass homesteading requires 
tough choices, and letting go of favored animals is one of them, and I'll miss her, but we have to be true to our plan. And so Egwene's going to find a new home. Now, the weather's getting cooler here on the homestead. Hopefully it is where you are as well. Um, it's cooler weather uh, we've had recently. It's been such a blessing. And I ho I'm not a fan of summer. I like it okay in the beginning, but it just seems to drag on and on. I'm the same way about winter. My favorite season is a toss-up between spring and fall. Right now, fall is my favorite season. But I can guarantee you that in March, my favorite season will be spring. <laughs> I, I tend to get seasonal affective disorder. Anyone familiar with this? Huh? Anybody else get that? SAD, seasonal affective disorder. As the winter, it's usually a winter, uh, it, it can happen in different times of the year, but it's usually, it happens in the winter. And uh, as the winter drags on and on, there's less sun, and vitamin D can be in short supply. Depression might not be far behind. And usually by the end of January, I'm really feeling it. Um, I get less and less motivated. It's like a like a train that just goes like, trugging slower and slower and slower. And by the end of February, I can be almost immobile. My level of motivation has fallen through the floor. Um, these days, at my age, I just accept what is and I don't try to fight it. I revel in my, shall I say, laziness and enjoy it while it lasts. Because come spring, the world will spin out of control with so much to do and no time to do it all. It's a familiar cycle for me, really. I've learned to ride it like a roller coaster. So right now we're kind of on the, the, the level. No big swings up or down. All right, let's get on to today's topic. How long does raw milk last? Well, the short answer is nearly forever. The only thing that will stop you from consuming it is an aversion to the taste. Uh, first, it becomes sour. Next, it will thicken into yogurt. However, it will be a very strong yogurt and um, but that yogurt will last a month or more um, and al so along that timeline you can drink the milk then it gets a little sour you might use it in cooking uh, or you can make cultured butter and buttermilk you know and so on so you just keep using it or throw it in the refrigerator and keep it uh, as as yogurt now contrast that with pasteurized milk pasteurized milk does not sour doesn't become sour. It rots. It literally rots. Um, it goes bad, and it's not safe for consumption at that point. You do not want to put it in your mouth under any circumstances. And on the other hand, when raw milk ages and starts to sour, this is good. It's great, in fact. You're, you're getting a lot more of those microbes in there. So it just depending on how much of that uh, can you tolerate. So what makes milk sour and what do I do with it? Well, the reason that raw milk starts to sour is because beneficial probiotic bacteria amounts are increasing and using up the lactose sugar and it, it's using up the sugar so it makes it taste sour. Again, it's like a nice unsweetened yogurt. So how long should your raw milk last when you get it home? Well, Sandra Clark, whose website is... Uh, Healthy Food Naturally, that's all one word, www.healthyfoodnaturally.com. She has this to say, if you get the milk the day, it's, if you, if you get the milk the day it's milked, it will stay fresh up to two weeks. If it sours, no worries, it will become yogurt with no help at all, with a little sour cream on top. Uh, without a starter, the sour cream on top usually bitters, so you can just scrape it off and compost it if you don't like the taste. As for the yogurt, when we have leftover milk at the end of the week, we just throw it in a ball jar and leave it in the fridge for if we get low on milk because it has an amazingly long shelf life after turning into yogurt. When we do run out of milk, we just throw some honey and fruit, usually berries, in and blend the yogurt into a tasty yogurt drink. I have some jars in there as old as two months and the yogurt tastes fine. Well, not like store-bought yogurt. 
to get that particular flavor, you need to manipulate it with a bacteria starter like for cheese making. But with honey and fruit added, it tastes wonderful. So that was uh, Sandra Clark. So according to Sandra, it really should last up to two weeks in your fridge. Now, that we're talking about the milk, not the yogurt. The yogurt, she said, over two months, and she's still, um, still using it. My experience, though, is I've kept milk for nearly a month before it soured. Uh, because in the spring we have tons of milk that happens often um, we just keep drinking it until the flavor goes off and then we use it for other purposes so we don't really worry about how long does it keep but again if you're looking for that range two weeks at least but it can go much farther beyond that just uh, we just keep drinking it until the flavor goes off and again then we just use it for other purposes once the flavor goes off it's not harmful to drink as opposed to as i said the pasteurized milk that goes bad you don't want to drink that stuff uh, so what is our secret to for what's our secret to milk lasting so long well it's twofold first cooling it quickly the faster it gets below 40 degrees the longer it's going to last and the second is keeping it very cold the colder you keep the milk, the longer it will last. Our milk refrigerator is set to 34 degrees, whereas our regular um, food refrigerator is at 37 degrees. And of course, it goes up a few degrees before the, the compressor turns on and then it brings it back down to 37 or 34 in the case of our milk refrigerator. So our milk refrigerator actually never gets over 37 degrees. Um, now, the problem that people have these days is actually having access to this great raw milk. And I will do another podcast on how we got to this point. But today, I'll just start, I'll just talk about where we are today. Um, there are lots of scary stories out there about how dangerous it is to drink raw milk. And I say it's hogwash and propaganda put out by some people in power with lobbyists to placate. The human species would have died out long before now, before that pasteurization process was in, invented in the previous century, if it was so dangerous. Um, there were dangers in the cities. As the cities got larger and larger, that's where they were having problem with contamination in milk and people getting sick and dying. Uh, and, and there are dangers in every food we consume, especially when you start making it in larger and larger quantities. So again, there are dangers in every food that we can consume. There, there are risks in every aspect of life. So you assess your comfort level with the risk and make your choice. And so I'll give some information on that again in another podcast on, you know, how did we get to this point? And, and some of that's going to include some of the scare stories, but it's also going to include the facts about what is your percentage chance of actually getting uh, some kind of illness. Now, as far as having the, the choice for raw milk, the problem is that uh, in many states, there there is no available choice for raw milk products unless you own your own cow. And that's why we started our herd share program. You can own part of a cow herd and receive the benefits of what your cows produce. And I'll talk quite a bit more on that a little bit later. Um, so it's so amazing to me that you can buy unpasteurized milk in the grocery store in 12 states. But the rest of the states, and, D, and Washington, D.C. Is, is in this particular uh, set of numbers. So there's 51 areas, and 12 of them, it's okay. You can just buy it in the grocery store. But the rest restrict it in various ways. It has to be labeled as pet milk in four states. 15 states, 15 states allow it to be sold directly from the farm, but not in the store. <laughs> Uh, and, of course, the herd share program is available in Virginia and 10 other states. And then in nine states, unfortunately, if you live in one of those states, all sales are illegal. And so are herd shares. So you have 12 states that think it's okay for us to buy raw milk and consume it freely. And the others are so certain that we're all going to die of horrible illnesses that it has to be restricted or illegal altogether. And I just cannot fathom the logic in this. 
If people were dying right and left, it would have been outlawed in all of those states, wouldn't it? I mean, who's telling the truth on this? Anyway, there's a lot of information out there. You have to make up your own mind. Um, and I'll say again, there is risk in consuming any food. Now, to help you make that decision as it pertains to raw milk, here's an article uh, from the U.S. National Library of Medicine uh, Department. It's a department of the National Institutes of Health, and there'll be a link in the show notes. So the title of this article, again, it's the U.S. National Library of Medicine, uh, a, a department of the National Institutes of Health. This article is titled, Recent Trends in Unpasteurized Fluid Milk Outbreaks, Legalization, and Consumption in the United States. That's a mouthful. Now, there's a ton of really great information in this study. Lots of data, as you might expect, and lots of charts and graphs. It's really good stuff. Now, I'm just, I'm just going to quote from the paragraph at the top. It's called the abstract, and it's in four sections. The first section is, quoting, introduction. Determining the potential risk of foodborne illness has become critical for informing public or er, informing policy decisions due to the increasing availability and popularity of unpasteurized raw milk. Methods. Trends in foodborne illnesses reported to the Centers for Disease Control in the United States from 2005 to 2016 were analyzed with comparison to state legal status and to consumption as estimated by licensing records. The results. The rate of unpasteurized milk associated outbreaks has been declining since 2010, despite increasing legal distribution. Controlling for growth in population and consumption, the outbreak break rate has effectively decreased by 74% since 2005. And then the final section is discussion. Studies of the role of on-farm food safety programs to promote the further reduction of unpasteurized milk outbreaks should be initiated to investigate the efficacy of such risk management tools. So that's just the brief um, introduction, the introduction, the methods, the results, the discussion, those are just brief summaries of what there's all kinds of information and data in, in the article. Um, this study was initiated because they were pretty sure that the incidence of raw milk in illnesses was going to increase as the access was increased. And they were just so sure people were going to be dying right and left. They were wrong. Um, now there's the a push for finding out if on-farm food safety programs are helping. I don't need a study to tell me that. They most certainly are. I've learned a lot of what I know because we've been studying cheese making for years and that is a very sanitary uh, process. You want only certain bacteria to be in the cheese or you're just not going to have a, a proper cheese. But others are just uh, starting out and they need to know about how to keep the environment sanitary and how to keep the milk clean and cold. They need to know that it's really important to cool the milk and quickly. And many still don't use bulk milk tanks, and they, they have other ingenious methods of co cooling it. Um, one favored method I've seen in a couple of different places is to put it in a freezer for two hours and then transfer it to the refrigerator so you get that freezer cool down quick. And um, I'm glad we have a bulk tank, else frozen milk in broken jars I think would be a regular disaster at my place. Uh, so I'm like, I'm glad we got a bulk tank. I get busy and forget stuff. Um, so they'd be frozen, jars broken. Anyway, heck, I can walk into another room and forget why I went in there. <laughs> Have you ever done that? All right, let me talk about raw milk in Virginia. In Virginia, the way to have access to raw milk is via the herd share. Um, you support the business by buying a share of the herd and, get a, and then you get a designated rate of return on your investment it's a, it's a commitment to be sure it's kind of like the wine buying club where you you're committing to a certain amount of product per month for as long as you're a member 
and it, it just you know keeps rolling along. And if you're you're looking for an affordable cow share herd program, Southern Virginia or the Piedmont Triad area of North Carolina, uh, if you're looking for a program that has quality, healthy, and long-lasting raw milk, cheese, butter, and yogurt, this is it. Uh, we're situated in Patrick County, Virginia, just northeast of Mount Airy, North Carolina. So we are 45 minutes to an hour from Winston-Salem. It's about an hour and 15 or 20 to uh, Greensboro. So uh, it's certainly certainly within driving distance for you. And I've got some customers coming from Sparta, uh, North Carolina. And then, of course, I have other ones that... The, most everybody coming from from quite a ways away so yeah it's uh because it's so hard to find all right so here here i've got four reasons that our cow herd share program is so good now number one we offer 100 percent heritage breed normandy and jersey milk cheese yogurt cream and butter from cows with certified a2 a2 genetics and i have a podcast on what a2 a2 genetics means and i'll include a link in the show notes briefly there was a genetic mutation that happened a while back um i think it was maybe a thousand years or several thousand years i can't even remember at this point anyway there was a genetic mutation that changed the structure of the milk and most milk today is not a2a2 in nature and some people do not have uh, lactose intolerance to A2A2 milk where they might with any other milk. It's interesting. That's that's an interesting podcast. You want to take a look at that. It's called uh, What is A2A2 Milk? One of the reasons we chose our heritage breed Normandy cows was the purity of those ancient genetics. So uh, number two. We use antibiotics only at great need and absolutely no growth hormones because we care for our pastures quite well. Our cows get only the best nutrition. Now, occasionally there is a need for antibiotics. It's no different than a human woman getting mastitis while breastfeeding. Sometimes it happens and you take care of it, you know, so if that's necessary, then that cow's milk is harvested separately until the treatment and the subsequent waiting period is long past. And uh, and the idea of forcing our cows to produce more milk with hormones is abhorrent to me. There is no regard for the health of the animal at all with hormones. There is only the focus on production. I don't think those that use these artificial means of increasing milk even see that the cows are living beings. They, they treat them like machines and, and just pump out as much as they can. And when the cows inevitably burn out due to overtaxing their bodies, forcing them to produce so much milk, then they're shunted off to the sale barn and they're replaced with a younger model. It's just, it's just disgusting what they do with that. All right, number three. Our cows are out on grass all the time, and they only come in for milking. Now, they do receive a small amount of non-soy, non-GMO grain supplement. Um, And this has two purposes. First, to entice the cow into the milking parlor, and so that they're always at ease coming into the milking parlor, and they want to come into the milking parlor. And then second is to make sure that each cow maintains her body condition when you're producing that much milk. Um... Cows can get pretty skinny. Our Normandy cows can get by with absolutely no supplemental feed and maintain their body condition at least until late in the season. Some of them maintain it all the way through. They're just such a great breed. Um, Now, we choose to make sure that they maintain their body condition from beginning to end. So we give them a little bit of supplement. We know that they're going to get weighed down over time. And so now the Jersey cow requires a great deal of more supplemental nutrition and uh, it is very easy for her to lose condition they're just a naturally skinny cow because most of their energy goes into producing milk Um, i recently did a podcast on this as well Um, the jersey cow is it breed is a wonderful choice for many people Um, but they do come with problems that we've not had to deal with before Um, 
with the Norman with our Normandies. And I won't go into the other details. It's in the, it's in the podcast that I did. But the days of uh, Jersey cows on our homestead are numbered. Again, they're wonderful cows, but they don't really fit what our goals are for our operation. Now, number four, to join our herd share program, it only costs $60 and one share is only $44 monthly. You can purchase half a share for $30 and $22 a month or multiple shares, multiple, you know, uh, prices on those if you have a larger family. So the herd produces milk from the first week of May through the last week of October. Yogurt and sometimes cream is also available in that time frame first week of May through the last week of October. Um, in the spring, there's always a glut of milk. We make lots and lots of cheese with that. And so our cheese is available year round and butter is available year round. And our cheeses are all raw milk cheeses. Um, and the legal requirement is that they be aged at least 60 days. However, none of our uh, cheeses are aged less than 90 days. So we, we age all of our cheeses well past that minimum. None of our cheeses would be worth a darn at, the, at, at 60 days. They need more time. And some only come into their flavor after many, many months. And they get better and better with age. And so we can have one year and even beyond 18-month Gouda, the Air Rat Legend, and, and the Alpine-style cheese. It's kind of like a Gruyere cheese. Oh, my gosh, those are awesome when they get past a year of aging. Anyway, that's uh, that's just uh, four four reasons for why our herd share program is so good. Now, if you want to check out a herd share uh, program, go to the go to our website www.peacefulheartfarm.com. You're gonna click and tap on herd share on the menu to get more information, or drop us a line via email, or give us a call. We'd love to have a conversation with you. And let me add a fun fact about raw milk. Remember the old wives tale about drinking warm milk to get to sleep? Well, that is likely due to the tryptophan in the milk. However, it doesn't really work anymore unless you have a raw milk resource. Pasteurization destroys the tryptophan. And that's it for today's topic. Let me finish up with a late summer recipe for homemade ice cream. So when it's warm outside, a cold, refreshing dish of ice cream can really hit the spot. Uh, this is a basic ice cream recipe that can be used as a base for many different flavors. Um, I've included a download link to the flavoring, something as simple as adding vanilla uh, or something as complex as like a rocky road. <laughs> So there's a lot of different flavors that you can put in there. And again, I've included a download link to the different recipes, the flavoring recipes. So this silky, luscious, and very classic custard can be used as the base for any ice cream flavor that you can dream up. Um, these particular proportions of milk and cream to egg yolk will give you a thick but not sticky ice cream that feels decadent but not heavy. Uh, for something a little lighter, use more milk and less cream as long as the dairy adds up to three cups. You can also cut down on egg yolks for a thinner base, but don't go below three. All right, so what you need is two cups of heavy cream and a cup of whole milk. You're going to use two-thirds a cup of sugar, an eighth of a teaspoon of fine sea salt, just a tad, six large egg yolks, and again, your choice of flavoring. So you're going to put in a small pot, you're going to simmer the cream, the milk, the sugar, and salt until the sugar completely dissolves for about five minutes. Remove the pot from the heat and in a separate bowl, whisk the yolks up, um, whisking constantly. Then you're going to whisk about a third of the hot cream into the yolks. Then whisk the yolk mixture back into the pot with the cream. So you're going to gently warm it up with a little bit of the milk and then you can put the whole thing into the pot with the cream. Return that pot to medium-low heat and gently cook it until the mixture is thick enough to coat the back of a spoon. If you're using an instant read thermometer, it'll be about 170 degrees. Strain it through a fine mesh sieve into a bowl. Cool the mixture to room temperature. 
then you're going to cover and chill it at least four hours or overnight. All right, so this is a little bit of a, this is like a two-day project. Churn in an ice cream machine according to your manufacturer's instructions after you've cooled it uh, for at least four hours or, as I said, overnight. So either start early in the morning or it's going to be overnight. All right, you're going to serve it directly from the machine for a soft serve, or if you put it in the freezer, then, you know, you, you can get it to harden up. All right, and remember, there's a download for the recipes for flavoring. So this is a cooked ice cream. It's, it's oh, my God, it's amazing. Oh, all right, final thoughts. I am so glad that summer's winding down. It was a long, rough summer. And I missed about half of it because of the appendicitis and uh, some other health issues that I had. And again, I'm not a huge fan of the heat of summer. And uh, so <laughs> glad it's done. Remember, contact us if you're interested in a Normandy bull to strengthen your herd genetics or if you're looking for that A2A2 Jersey heifer for yourself or to add to your own herd. If you're not into raising your own cow but still want the benefits of raw milk products, we're here to help you out with that. Um, for us, the benefits of raw milk and raw milk products far outweigh the small risk factor that comes along with it. Um, and again, I'm going to do another podcast on the statistics for the number and percentage of illnesses attributed to raw milk consumption shown in the larger scope of food in general. Where does it fall in general on that list of foodborne illnesses? Um, I hope you try out some of that really great ice cream. I hope you try some of those neat flavoring recipes in these last days of summer and the early autumn. Share your experiences in the comments on the recipe page. You know, there's a link in the show notes. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hop over to Apple Podcast, subscribe, give me a five star rating and review. Also, the best thing you can do, share it with any friends or family who might be interested in this type of contact. I would really appreciate it. As always, I'm here to help you taste the traditional touch. Thank you so much for stopping by the homestead. And until next time, may God fill your life with grace and peace. <music>